Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andy Graham. Reef safety, as most people describe us, are we're the people that do the locks. So, that, so those who do use us, thank you very much, and uh, and keep buying the locks. Now, just as a bit of variety, we've constantly been asked for, can we deliver training as well? So we moved into adding training into our business, uh, and we teamed up with Mark Wright Training Solutions, and very relevant for all industries and uh, this afternoon I'd like to introduce Mark Wright who heads up our training division if I could um, introduce you without further ado Mark thank you very much. Thanks for that Andy and thanks for inviting us down here today for the presentation as Andy just mentioned most of you folks listening today will be very familiar with Reese. for many years Reese has been supplying a very comprehensive lot auto service, so lockout, tag out, and try out equipment into the quarrying industry and many of others. Some of you might have dealt with us at work at height training. You may have used our consultants for confined space registers and uh, for rescue training. So today, what I wanted to do really was use this opportunity to address the subject of work at height duty holder roles but also to introduce Reese. So it's a, a super opportunity for us as a business to introduce you, to us to you and to let you know where we're coming from these days. So we're working a lot of the time with brick plants and block plants and uh, paper mills and waste sites. So it's a very good opportunity for us today. And we wanted to share some good information as well. So the title that I put up on the screen sort of says it all really. It's the Work at Hike Supervision uh, Seminar, I suppose is the best phrase for it. Not training, but a seminar, seminar sort of situation. I'm going to cover the awareness that a duty holder should have before they deploy people to work at height around your facilities. That's the primary thrust, thrust that I'm going to use. Within our company, we like to call uh, our services journeys. We want you to work with us for many, many, many years. And we want, as a couple of the guys were saying a minute ago about family relationships, we like to work with people for a long time and build a trust. And when you're working in the industries that we work with, we class the business that we're in as a critical safety training sort of side. So we have a confined space journey. We have a lockout journey. We have a work at height journey. And uh, I wanted to sort of talk to everybody about some of these things. Been asked to chat today about the, the duty holder role. But you can't really do the duty holder role unless you know what you've got with relish, relation to work at height. So on the screen, I'll, I'm just going to sort of leave it there while you can read it at the screen, to be honest. And we, we do a lot of work surveying sites. We train people to manage work at height activities. We do sell equipment. I mean, my colleague Clive, that's his side of the business. We, we do sell equipment, but only once we've made a judgment of what people need. So working with duty holders, we like to set a journey in place. We like to finish the journey and we like to look after your staff and yourselves throughout that journey, throughout many years, hopefully. And on the screen, you can see as well as I can, there are two columns. These are the injuries from seven ladder accidents, severe blood loss, fractured vertebrae. You can see as well as I can on the screen. I've got head injuries, shattered heels, fractured skulls. Use of a ladder, a 1.5 metre ladder, maybe a three metre ladder, but a ladder all the same. It's basic work at height, but a lot of people don't refer to it as work at height. We, uh, we grab a ladder and use them. I've got a bruised chest on the bottom left of that screen and then serious back injuries, partial amputations, head, neck and back injuries, elbow injuries. It's almost embarrassing to mention an elbow injury from a work at height, but it ends up with death. So there we are. We've got a series of um, consequences of work at height, albeit very, very specifically to deal with ladders. So I thought, well... Let's talk about some of the consequences and then also let's have a look at some of the, um, the more horrific sort of things. Photo and photograph number nine from a survey, from a report. It says pretty clearly, the conveyor cover down which the supervisor slid feet first, face down and then fell to the concrete slab below. It's an asphalt plant. Now, 
you can see at the top of the screen where the red arrow is, the airline and the pneumatic chisel that the supervisor was going to use when they fell from that position, slid down, hit the fan and dropped off some 18, 18 metres or so to the ground and was killed. Now, I'm going to be so totally open. Um, this is not in the UK, I'm so pleased to say, but I'm sad to say it's anywhere. But it could be. It might have been. It might be. Um, the duty holder for the work at height, the individual was able to climb over the side of a perfectly usable barrier. The measures weren't in place to prevent that from happening. The supervision wasn't there. The permits were issued and the lockout was in place. But the individual followed custom and practice. And it's that kind of custom and practice that we want the duty holder within the work at height regs within the UK to drive home the thought process. You look at the photograph and you think, wow, that could be my site. Or you're thinking, absolutely no chance on my site. So I wanted to use photographs from around our client base in some respects, um, all available around the UK. I'm going to take us to a Viridor site, to an ERF, a power station plant, down in Splot, the place is called, in South Wales. The man was seen scaling the roof. That's the first sort of thing. Um, dealing with this site for quite a few years, you can see two guys working on the roof and one of them's climbing up. The next photograph shows him sledging. Is that the word? Slaying or sledging down? Holding his phone in front of him for YouTube. Slid down. They had a perfectly good permit in place. They had a perfectly good system of work. Both men were trained and both men had work at high equipment. Everything was in place by a really, really diligent company. But the guys went rogue when they got out of sight. And it just happened to be videoed by the BBC who were filming one of these, um, you know, the, the, the Greenpeace type thing. So work at height, supervision, work at height, duty holder. So I wanted to raise your awareness. I'm probably going to talk about things that everybody knows already. That's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that I'm just going to make you think, wow, it can't happen on my site, but I'm going to do a toolbox talk next week. If you don't do anything else, it might make you think, I warned somebody. Um, the regulations and standards and guidances are all on the screen. It's not a course, but I just wanted to sort of throw into everybody that there's a lot of things in place in the UK to prevent all the accidents we see. But I'm sad to say it does me out of a perfectly good job. And it, it, it's almost theoretical nonsense that people will never, ever get it wrong. We've got a lot of regulations there to drive folk. But let's look at the photographs. Um, and again, we've got some, uh, we can chat about any of these at any point. And, but I'm going to build into these. In the UK, we've got the Worker Eight regulations. And there's actually 19 regulations that we could chat about. So there's 19 regulations and um, a series of schedules relative to the regulations. But they put a duty on individuals. And the duty holder that I want to chat about today is any person who controls the work of others. I want to remind that individual, I don't know who any of you are. Um, some, some names I'll recognise, obviously, but I don't know what role you fulfil, but you will be the person controlling the work of others. Some of you. You've actually took the time and trouble to join in the, the meeting, so therefore you will have some interest. You could have just carried on working, but you've got an interest uh, in well-being of your site. So the regulations place a duty, particularly on any person who controls the work of others. And it's that individual I want to sort of throw some information at. It doesn't matter whether I'm working at a low height or a high height. The, the consequences can still be the same and it could be fatal. The guy on the left-hand side is working on a Dobstat screening plant on a composting facility. The, uh, the, the second photograph from the left is an AD plant working on top of the tanks, replacing a, a damaged elbow on the pipework. And very recently, there's been the, the, the horrific accident down in uh, Avermouth, where four people were killed on top of, an, of a digester of a very similar nature. Working at height, Maybe working at height if I'm on the exposed area, but not work at height if I'm on the gantry. I've got working off temporary scaffolds and I've got working off roofs. And I'm sure within your areas of remit, you will have all of this sort of activity in place. I could take us to a, um, to a brick or a block manufacturing plant with silos. 
with a lot of systems in place on these silos, we can get up top, we can work up top safely. We can reach the top of the, of the silo safely. We can even get inside the silos following a plan, nice and safely, completely in keeping with, with the planning and organization requirements of regulation four of the worker height regs. Um, maybe, maybe within scope of trying to avoid the worker height by putting uh, platforms around the top of the vessels under reg six. But I think I'll have a rescue plan to get people back down, no matter what the consequence of injury on the top. It might not be a fall from height. It might just be that I've got to get them down from height because they become unwell. So the kind of places that I'm talking about on this session, they can be from low height to high height. They can be complex to basic. But the regulations are pretty clear on the screen there. I've just summarised a few of them, really, just to sort of mention. All the photographs I'm going to show require a duty holder to be involved. And this is a duty holder awareness raising session. I'm gonna remind you, I'm gonna jog your memory rather than teach. I'm gonna raise your awareness rather than preach, but I'm gonna raise your awareness no matter what. Uh, work at Act should be properly planned and organized. Those involved in work at Act should be competent. Reg 5 demands competency. I want to sort of make duty holders think, do we ever ask people to produce a certificate of competency to use a lanyard, to use a harness, to anchor to an anchor point. I've got regulation 10 and regulation 11. If something falls off the top of a conveyor or off the top of a tank, did we have a nice secure zone at the bottom or did we just go bang and squash somebody? A plastics manufacturing plant down at Rochester last year had an incident where a 45 kilogram piece of plastic fell. It hit somebody on the shoulder and it damaged the neck and spine quite badly. Everything was in place from a lockout point of view. Everything in place was good from a worker eye access point of view. There was no safety zone around the bottom of the work point and an, in, an injured party resulted. I've got to make sure we use collective measures. We risk assess. We use the most suitable equipment. The choice of a ladder compared with a podium under Regulation 7. Look for the most suitable kit. The provision of a harness and lanyard rather than a scaffold or something else. So the regulations are quite searching, they're quite detailed, and they're very good, to be quite honest, in my view. I'm coming from the point of a consultant, an advisor maybe, and a, a trainer, uh, as well as a worker. I work at height quite often, so I want it right. When does it become work at height? There's always a massive argument over this over every, every facility. I need to access the screens up there to replace the screens. So I make safe access onto the screen deck, but then I start removing screens. I might have a fall from height within or a fall off, but most of the time I'm inside a barrier of some sort, good or bad barrier. The duty holder must have a risk assessment and a plan in place. We've got to foresee the foreseeable and almost foresee the unforeseeable. We've got to make it right. We've got to go a long way with things and think we've got to visit the workplace. I can't just put a ladder up and climb onto the conveyor. I can't just walk along the belt and I can't just climb over the handrail at the end. We need to be sure that planning is in place, that workplaces are inspected under Regulation 13. I've got to make sure, again, um, I've got to make sure I stay within barriers and rails to be sure I'm inside what we call a collective zone. So part of the regulation demands that the duty holder is a responsible individual competent individual and that's going to include training at some point it might just be a risk assessment sort of photograph it might be that we'll look at a workplace and think what if i've got a perfectly good safe workplace here until i need to remove the spool piece in the middle of the screen you can just see there's maybe an 18 inch section there that wants to be unbolted do i lean out do i straddle the uh, handrail do i make it safe or do I just go with the flow and dive in there where I dive in and I shouldn't be doing? So we've got duty holders, risk assessment, safe procedures, rescue planning, safe access, safe egress. A perfectly safe workplace can be made dangerous by standing on the handrail. It can be quite horrific. So that's the sort of thing I wanted to raise everybody's awareness today. What might not have been risk assessed as, an, as a height activity can very easily be made into a height activity by standing above the walking point 
by standing on the handrail, by leaning over and uh, stretching, uh, overreaching, and just changing the scope of a job. On one of my client sites, we found a podium. So if you imagine where the cyclone is or the, the structure there, the cone, uh, a podium set, a perfectly good podium at ground level to reach a conveyor just above head height, taken up onto a platform like this to raise them higher and higher above the handrail. The work at height element changed massively, but no re-risk assessment was made, if that's the right wording. No extra planning, no things were in place, no permitry was there. No injury, no accident, but certainly a failed audit. Thankfully found it could have been custom and practice for quite a while. Thankfully discovered, thankfully found before incidents. So I wanted to raise using a series of photographs um, a little bit of thought process for the work at height duty holder. And I don't know if any of these are photographs that you sort of get a bit of a, of a feel or emotion for or, or a bit of synergy. But I'm looking at a workplace that's quite well planned and organised. We have um, quite a busy area. And I can see that there is a levelling, well, a tensioning, a tensioning belt in the, in the right hand side of the photograph. A platform was built to give access to the rollers. Perfectly well risk assessed, very thoroughly risk assessed. This we can always find. So if you see extra things that I'm not mentioning, if you see something, there we go. That's excellent. Um, what the site didn't see was the chance of falling through the untensioned belt during maintenance activities. So on the right of the screen, you can see the roller and the black belt. It's a perfect fall point when it's there the only reason for someone going up there is to be there when it's not tensioned and at that point we could fall through and drop quite a distance downwards so what seems good at one point and what is really good in someone's eyes who are very close to the job a stranger walks up and goes wow there's a breach that's the sort of thing i wanted to sort of drive for everybody i don't know if you've got these places or not got these places walking to the edge inside a guarded zone, thankfully. Once it's isolated, it's isolated. The Lototo side of this site is absolutely splendid. But working on the roller, cleaning around the roller, and with the trip acid into the uh, hopper, we, we have now got a work at height issue that may or may not have been risk assessed. It's not the kind of place maybe we would be every time or every minute of every day, but on the occasions we need to be there, we, we must have a plan and be able to get in there safely and back out of there safely. So, right, using photographs, I wanted to build up a few thought processes. A permit was issued on a power station. Contractors were given a task working from a scissor lift. And at this point in the photograph, we can see those contractors working out of scope of the permit. They have left the safety of the scissor lift and proceeded sideways. They are standing quite high up, but to reach the scaffold top, they have come along the uh, unistruct channeling. They've come along the cable trays. So we now have a potential failure to plan and organize properly. We call it a lost time incident on this particular site. They have, they have failed to control the job properly at, at this moment in time. The contractors have gone rogue. They're working out of scope of the um, the work system and uh, they have climbed out of the scissor lift along the structure and reaching a random point with no measures in place the duty holder was asked by the management when did they last check on these contractors a permit was issued at about 8 15 in the morning and they were next checked at one o'clock in the afternoon it's not good enough it leaves too much to be desired from time to time. So here we've actually got one of those odd times that has become rogue, unfortunately. No incidents, no accident, no fatality, nobody fell, but certainly stamped upon. Change procedures, walk the job first. The permit was issued in a permit office, but nobody walked the job properly. Nobody encouraged the contractors to come back and say, listen, we've reached a problem. So we've now got problems within the duty holder role for work at height management. The guy staring down with the blue jumper on is the permit acceptor. He undertook to make things safe. 
but the same individual as the guy highest up at risk. So lots of little things over the years. I photographed from the HSE publications database there, from the HSE newspaper articles. He suffered serious fatal head injuries. An individual fell from that very short ladder, struck his head on the floor and died. Could it happen on your site? Is it work at height? Do we cherish it as work at height? Or are we looking for higher? Is high, high, very high? Or can you die at a low level? We've got a guy here, suffered serious injuries, and died in the fall. I showed this photograph to one of the guys I work with and he went, no way can you die from that lowness. I don't know if that's a proper word, but there we go. No way can you die from that lowness. It's one of those things, isn't it? Okay, a failure to plan properly. There was a big prosecution. It's a very, I'm gonna say, if I dare, it's an interesting incident for us to review in our own private time and try and make sure this doesn't happen on our facilities. Do we use ladders? Do we have ladders? Do contractors bring a ladder in the back of the van that they could roguishly use out of scope? So the duty holder under the work at height regulations, they need to be competent. They need to have a feel, a flair and a grasp and they need to have a cherish. They need to cherish that job. Um, we're not just going to write a permit and let people go. An individual fell from this conveyor belt, jumping off it back to the platform. That never sounds good, does it really? They fell from the platform, broke both wrists and damaged an ankle. They had been climbing up onto there for quite some years to unblock the conveyor belt where it goes into the hopper. We could have, we could have designed out the hopper. The lid stops things overflowing but it blocks. It ended up needing to be unblocked on a regular basis. But people put up with the blockage and then sent others to clear the blockage. It started off leaning up with a stick and unblocking. It cascaded then outwards over a few months to climbing on the lower handrail, the mid rail, to climbing right up onto the belt over a period of a year or so. Completely lost control of the activity. And it only be came relevant or known when somebody got injured. Now, fortunately, that wasn't a fatality. It was dealt with, um, investigated, dealt with, changed, modified, and people trained out, people assessed out and supervised far more seriously. Um, could it happen on your sites? Is it something that you think, wow, I'm gonna check for this today. I'm gonna remind people tomorrow. It's the role of the worker eye duty holder and the employer to have risk assessed all activities. An engineer fell from a stepladder working on the sheeting system on this vehicle, but less than 10 metres away was a sheeting gantry that they could have worked from. A guy called Tom Merry, I think, was the inspector at the time in the Manchester region, and he challenged the site over this seriously looked at it all. They, they had failed to use the equipment that was provided for safety. Very, very important. On the night shift, they decided, we don't really need to follow the rules because there's no supervision and there's no managers. They created their own custom and practice. It is work at height, it's serious work at height, and a man was injured. And it, it, it came into the fore that the supervision element had dropped massively on the site. Custom and practice, led to an incident. So the role of the duty holder is to look at jobs, it's to assess jobs, it's to work with people. I know each time I visited a quarry, I've been asked for my competency certificates, whether it's my, uh, my SPA or my MPA passport ticket or my confined space supervision or my work at height. But some factories don't ask. Some people don't always ask. So this memory jogger, it's quite an opportunity for me to meet you and to have the luxury of reminding you about stuff, I suppose. Risk assessment and procedures should be in place, this photograph illustrates. Using a standard hop up to reach a workplace that you couldn't reach easier. Uh, it could be good, it could be bad. It's all down to people's rules. It's a perfectly legal piece of kit, but is it, is it the best piece of kit? So we want to make sure that the equipment is the most suitable under Regulation 7 of the Worker Height Regs. Is a hop-up the most suitable piece of kit for the task that we're looking at? Can we better it? Can we improve it? When I look across the site, 
peering across the site. Do I see competent workers or bad workers? Do I see a lost control or do I see a fully controlled worker eye activity? Am I looking at a vehicle that could knock the guy off his ladder? And am I looking at the ladder being footed properly? Am I looking at disrespect for the worker eye planning and regulation? And when we ask these two guys, have they ever been ladder trained? With roars of hysterical laughter, ladder training. I know I get laughed at when I mention to people. My wife is one of the worst. Um, she's worked in a pub and have used ladders. They've still got to be trained. Or toolbox talks or something to determine competency. So we're looking on a site there. I'm not looking at competent workers. I'm not looking at a good risk assessment. I'm not looking at good practice. But I'm not, I'm not looking at people who's gone out to break any regulation. I'm looking at people who need better control. And we are the duty holders. So that's what the session's all about, really. I didn't know what the value of today was going to be for any of you. Um, so we are always nervous presenting to new folk. But a memory jogger is a memory jogger. I can't lose out on that. Is Could this be your site or are you better than the managers on this facility? Are your staff better than the guys doing the job on this particular job? Or could it happen anywhere? I think that's the best way of looking at stuff, isn't it? I've got a workshop engineer there working with a ladder. Side loading the ladder is a, a problem on the site. It's actually a disciplinary offence on that facility. Side loading the ladder is not acceptable in any shape or form here, but it's allowed. It's been passed by by a manager. A safety officer has seen it happening and um, it now needs reminding. And when I move away from ladders to equipment, I'm now looking at worker eye kit. I'm looking at your typical PPE, which is the last resort. Um, I'm looking at harnesses. I'm looking at uh, twin shock absorbing lanyards and anchors. I'm looking at a piece of rope adjustment device called a Grion, a work positioning device. I'm looking at people working on top of platforms and leaning on motors. I'm looking at people working on open steel structures, maybe. As soon as I give this sort of kit out, I need to know the user is competent. I need to issue a permit. It needs to be inspected. I need to have a plan to get them back. We sell all of this kit, as does many other companies, but we like to think we visit a site quite often and we'll judge things. We'll say, well, this isn't the rest the best piece of kit for what you need, and this is the wrong kit to anchor just here. I find a lot of shock absorbers anchored to handrail, knowing that the handrail is not strong enough. Auditing a permit system not long ago, we identified that the, the permit ropes anchor to the six inch acid pipeline because it's a good strong anchor point, but it's an acid pipeline with flanged systems. I'm looking at a gentleman there who's installing a safety device called a safe tech. I don't know if you've got them in your sites, but on, the, on the, the paper processing plant just here, we take paper up the conveyor and we drop it into a hogger, which spins very, very quickly. It's well isolated. The guy is installing a safe tech, which is a sensor device, if you're not familiar with them. If a, if a person lands on the belt and gets dragged up, it turns the machinery off before they're killed in the hogger. This guy's climbed a step ladder. The step ladder is at the back of the photograph underneath, underneath the conveyor. It's got to be isolated. So we're building a few points for the duty holder. The guy in the previous photograph is a contractor, but this is a staff. This guy is working on a, a block plant and um, he's standing on a very, very slippery, very clayey, wet, plastic step. It, it's just waiting to slip from. I'm hoping I've not queried the pitch for him today. Um, it doesn't require a permit because its staff is doing a routine maintenance function. It's done every day, every minute. It's there permanently, but is it the right place to be? And as soon as we give equipment, we've got to have better risk assessments, better, better devices and better planning. The man on the right is facing a 55 foot drop into a digestate tank on a waste facility. The man on the left, he faces a 55 foot drop over the side into a similar place. The man on the left is wearing a full arrested device with a safety belt. The man on the right, full body harness, properly equipped with a restraint device above him. The man on the left could fall to his death. The man on the right can't. 
Both work for the same sort of business. One's risk assessed properly by competent people. The other is risk assessed loosely by the individual who bought the cheapest piece of kit that they thought would work. The duty holder. There's a few of the uh, consequences or the causational factors. Failure to get alternatives to work at height. Failure to plan and organise. Further down the page, I've got failure to ensure competency. Failure to develop suitable and sufficient rescue plans. I don't need Thunderbirds for every job, but I certainly need a plan. If someone's working in a scissor lift or a cherry picker, I need to know how will we get them down? How will we get them down if they become unwell? How will we recover them if the equipment is jammed up there and it can't be lowered by the normal methods of safety? Incorrect choice of equipment. Um, the one I keep coming back to though, Failure to plan and organise, failure to provide a valid method of work. These are all the causational factors that come back time after time after time. So could these be yours? Could they never happen for you? Are you better than the people that have fallen foul of this sort of issue? And when we come to equipment, we've got to get it right. No longer should we just be buying a harness and putting it in a cupboard. We shouldn't just buy a rope device because the consultant says this is good equipment. My MD and myself visited a site in the very, well, in the last week, and I visited a similar site a month before, and we opened a cupboard full of rescue equipment and safety equipment, and it was still bagged. It was between four and six-year-old, the equipment. It was still bagged from the day it was purchased. Now, that's a good thing. Uh, except for the fact it was also practical equipment that was meant to be used for tasks. The tripod was beautiful. It was so nice. The winch, you could cuddle if you want to cuddle a winch. And the harnesses were impeccable. They'd never been used. So what a waste of money. I worked out in my own mind around about £12,000 worth of equipment bought after a consultancy project, but never used because it's the wrong kit. They bought rope access kit to go over the side of silos that they never go over the side of. They bought harnesses that were the most beautiful in the world when they couldn't use that particular kit. So we like to think at Reese that we, we would look out. Paul in the photograph took this photograph with total permission. He's never going to smile and he's never going to be happy because he's geared up to the max for a quick job. But under Reg 5 on the bottom left of my screen, it shows his competence. He is a competent work at height technician. He's only an engineer, not a rope access technician. He's an engineer going to clean the top of a bin wagon. That's what Paul's going to do. He's wearing a full body harness with the right kind of safety helmet for height work. If he falls off or bangs his head, the helmet stays on, he's safe. He's got lanyards, he's got a, what they call a byline system. He's got everything in place that his diligent manager and himself has assessed. He's trained, certified with it. It's right. He's not happy, but he's got the kit and he's using it. His predecessor was sacked for failing to use the equipment after training. One stroke, gone. That's a diligent company. These are the kind of people I'm hoping you folk are. These are the kind of companies I'm hoping I'm talking to today. And I'm being pompous saying that answer. I'm hoping I'm talking to the right people. I mean, my name's Mark Wright and I work for Reese Safety. And we like to think we do a good job for folk like yourselves. And we've done a good job with Paul, but he's done a better job for his manager because he's using the kit. He's using it not after an accident, at the same time, on the same site, though, we discovered a piece of equipment that was in use and it's defective. It's rusty. It's scraped or chafed, but it does have an Alliance insurance tag on it still. And they've been so pre-programmed on that site. If it's got an insurance tag, use it. The guys weren't competent at that time to carry out pre-use inspections of the equipment on the Reg 12 of... Uh, the work at height regs or within reg five, I think it is of pure. So I think it's that one anyway, but we're looking at equipment that should be inspected pre-use as well as routine. It had a six month inspection tag, but it's certainly not usable. Okay, so it makes the subject nicer, doesn't it? There's a guy who's fallen 6.75 meters from an anchor point. 
So simulation, this site practices rescues. They practice, 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 and they've never had an incident. They're all disappointed because they've never been able to rescue anybody. This guy has just pushed himself out to show what 6.75 metres distance looks like from the anchor point in this photograph. That man has anchored at the top and is simulating a full distance drop. Now, OK, a guy the other day said there's a platform next to him. It can be easily rescued, but that's not what the story is about. If he fell, what are the likely consequences of the fall? We've got a drop like gravity, like a steam train coming to a sudden stop or a road traffic accident. We don't have steam trains, really. Uh, he's got a broken neck, a smashed skull. The helmet stayed on, but... Is going to suffer um, suspension syncope. He will be, his heart rate will be increasing and his blood flow will be reducing. There will be pressure in some places and the guy will be poorly if he's still alive. We'll have broken spine, maybe broken ribs and broken knees for sure. It will be a real mess. And we're going to ask one of you people to try and rescue him. Wow. We shouldn't have let him fall in the first place. That's where I'm coming from. We should have planned it, organised it, and give him the equipment to keep him safe. If he is likely to fall, well, maybe different equipment should have been used because, above all, the regulations want us to avoid the worker eye issues in the first place where we can. And where we can't, I need a couple of blokes like these two. Um, somewhere in the background is a young lady there who's another rope technician, and she's the backup. These two guys are at the point trying to reach down to carry out remote rescue of a suspended casualty. Now, I know that the MPA is, it was very keen on, on using a lot of this rope technique, not rope access, remote rescue of a suspended casualty using grab devices. Some stuff is excellent. We hang it up and reach. Some, we have to be professional riggers. We practice. We rig, we practice again, we log, we evidence. These two guys could rescue this man in less than three minutes, which is absolutely champion in my view. This is a simulation. They're being photographed so they can prove before an outage that they can deal with pretty well anything. If they touch the mushed up body, I don't know what they would do, but they can certainly grab it and get it to where it's meant to be, and then we deal with the aftermath. This is one of the courses that we provide. We can work with people on plant or off plant. We can work with them in our training centres, and we can simulate stuff, and we can prepare people, but only if they know they need to be prepared first. We can deal with people going over the side on the left or onto structures on the right. So I've got rope access disciplines, We've got remote rescue from height. We've got uh, the use of restraint devices and man safe wire systems. We train the people who supervise the man on the left and the guy on the right. We, we can train and supervise the people in this sort of place. And above all, we'll work with clients and with yourselves to make sure people have assessed work before uh, anything can go wrong. The guys in the photograph here, they're doing ladder training. It's one of the craziest courses in the world, but what an uptake on that type of training. On the floor is a domestic ladder. They're inspecting that ladder. It's been in use on site for four years. Uh, it's a, it was a class three ladder. I think it's BS2037, a class three domestic ladder in a very industrial environment. It shouldn't have been there. They didn't know about that until the day they did a ladder course. And the two men on the right of the photograph, they're the manager and the ladder inspector. They did not know there was a difference. That's not competency. They should be competent. And for them to admit it on a course was champion. It was brilliant. But it's the first time in four or five years they'd even known there was a difference. Had there been an accident, maybe other folk would have investigated then. There was no accident. It was discovered. It was removed and things set in place. So, so high height, we think about low height. We don't quite often. Um, ladder use, we don't always think about because it's nonsensical to a lot of people. And anybody can grab a ladder. But it's got to be checked. It's got to be the right piece of kit. We can't modify them. The engineers here have done a beautiful modification. 
They put their own hoops there in a splendid fashion to give access to a bolograph shredder machine. It's actually got a ladder tag just below the man's hand. I know there's a ladder tag. And um, for him to be told this ladder's defective because it's been modified, he was mortified. Horrified wasn't even the close to it. He thought he'd made a real mess because he'd been doing it, he'd been inspecting it for years. It's education. So work at high competencies. It can be toolbox talks or major external training. It can be eye path training for cherry pickers of scissor lifts or plasma training for hop ups and uh, for zip ups. It could be work at eye user training or work at eye supervisor training. Builds competencies. Experience helps and training assists. I've got a group of people. I'm sticking with ladders for a few seconds because I do a lot of work within the waste industry and they've had lots of ladder issues in the last three years. We asked these guys to bring their own ladder with them. And I don't know if you can see, but patently in front of the guy with the orange boiler suit, there is one foot on the ladder and one missing. This would have been in use had the course not been delivered. So competencies. It doesn't matter what the equipment is or how high the height is, but it requires something to be done. So Regulation 4 demands organisation and planning. Reg 5 demands competency. Uh, regulation 6 of the work at height regulations wants us to avoid the work at height element in the first place. And that means we've got to know what work at height actually is. So what is work at height? If we're going to give equipment out, we've got to go even deeper. What kind of anchor point are we going to use? Is it a fixed anchor? an installed anchor, or is it something dynamic, like a huge steel structure that they're going to work with? Is the fall going to be over the side and you'll impact onto something below you or be impaled on something or fall into a shredder uh, or a kibbler, for God's sake? Um, so it all depends on the kind of equipment we've got. Or is the equipment good enough to stop you falling in the first place? Are we going to put a dynamic load or is it a static load? If we use a rope, will it elongate because we've got it wet? And if it's a long rope already, will it elongate a bit further and drop me into that crocodile that's just waiting to catch me? So a lot of risk assessment. We've got to plan for the worst and control the activity and check people as if we just don't trust them. So the role of the duty holder under the work at height regs is quite immense. That really is the slide that I wanted to sort of get to with some pictures of equipment I wanted to let you see the journey that we're capable of taking you on from Reese. We like to visit sites because we learn from you. We also like to think we can help you. So we survey sites at a cost. I've got to put that there straight away. We do management training. We train supervisors. We train, we train directors. We'll train auditors. We'll train people to manage their work at height tasks. And we like to look at it, not generically, but industry by industry and site by site. So we involve you in a lot of that. We know you've got a lot of equipment there in blue and white. You've already got a kit. I've been, I've been horrified with a few sites I visited recently to do this. They've all bought equipment. They've got it in fantastic cupboards and it's not been used. If I had to do that and account to my manager, I know I'd be getting a right telling off. But the worry is they bought this stuff and put it there as a token gesture with no, no inspection. Four years, no inspection, safety kit. The day it's needed, will it snap? The day it's needed, will it be unraveled or will they have to start unraveling it? And that breaks into the rescue response time. If somebody is suspended at height, we've got to deal with it. If they've had a heart attack at height, we might deal with it as a first aid issue and the public emergency services will assist fairly quickly. But if they're suspended, it takes a different scenario. We've got to be better. Um, we might look at risk assessments and procedures and permits and first aid. And then training people, training people to use kit. There's a difference between putting a harness on and knowing where to anchor and what to anchor. There's a difference between the people who can position themselves at height and work like an engineer and those who just stand on a platform and do things within a safe zone, a collective area. Reese can also help with access and rescue training for our clients. And we can also assess 
we can carry out gap analysis for existing systems. So we can do a lot together. My colleague Clive is on the system there with, with my managing director, Andy Graham. My name's Mark Wright and we work for Reef Safety. So I've finished my part. So I'm gonna pass it back to Andy Graham, if you don't mind, um, if that's okay. And go from there really thank you mark thank you for that um i hope you found that interesting you know some good mark's got a a, a raft of uh experience and uh horror stories and also good practice that you've seen around various sites thank you very much to mark there a very interesting topic there and he covered pretty much everything that you can imagine i'm sure it's given everyone pause, pause for thought on aspects of working at heights situations equipment and uh, obviously training and managing uh, working at height. So yeah, really uh, interesting uh, way of putting that forward there, Matt. Thank you. Well, We'd yeah, like to thank you. Andy, Mark and Clive in the background for uh, their, present, uh, their presentation today. Um, uh, obviously they've got a lot more aspects they can uh, run through with uh, all, all the companies that are on, on the uh, IQ meeting today. Um, and we'll, Look at bringing that to a close. Next month's meeting is uh, the 9th of March uh, with Locker Wright, a, a chap called Philip Chow. They'll be giving us a company uh, overview of projects and services they supply and, uh, and um, case studies, a couple of case studies that they've worked on. But um, thank you all for attending. There's some great attendance today. Mm -hmm.